Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here on this uh, Thursday night. We're live from the SEC studios in White Bear Lake. And if you're seeing this any other time than September 12th, it is a replay, so don't call in. Uh, but otherwise, please call in with your comments or questions, 651-747-3838. If you don't want to call in, we have an email there, speechlessmn at gmail.com. And tonight, a uh, lot of news going on all over the place. Um, part of it is the silence of the Minnesota Supreme Court. Uh, why they aren't answering cases that have been brought before them. Uh, so we're going to get in that in a little bit. Uh, so many things. Let's see. We may get into Syria a little bit, my perspective on that. Um, there's an appellate court ruling on Carolyn Rice, who's out of um, Scott County, a criminal case where uh, her conviction was reversed and remanded. Uh, we're just going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, just found out about it today, but the decision came out August 19th. This was in front of Judge Perkins, one of the Scott County judges that I believe uh, uh, is about an unjust judge as you can get. Uh, in my opinion, and um, he's had to deal with some difficult people, I will admit that, but it's compounded by other factors in it. But, you know, he's part of the system that's making it difficult because what happens when people's rights are being violated? They get angry <laughs> and uh, people speak out and so, uh, and they try to defend their rights. And when you get a public defender that says, I will not defend you, I will not present your case, and I will not present your evidence and not give your reason, and you know you have a good case, uh, and you, you get rid of that public defender and then you're stuck because Perkins is going to go and say, well, you know, you're not going to get a different one if you want one again. No, I want a different one because this one specifically told me I will not defend you. You know, uh, I mean, it's, it's bad news uh, down there in Scott County all the way around. Um, some updates on Maplewood we'll be looking into, what's going on in Maplewood. Uh, some interesting aspects about the elections and the sales tax in the Maplewood Communist Center, or, or otherwise known as the Community Center. Matamidi, uh, what's happening there? Uh, a school, grade school shut down. Uh, it was evacuated, and a lot of excuses going on, and uh, uh, difference of opinions of what took place between the school board and the uh, fire department. So what is really going on? Of course, they've had the um, problem with the uh, being built very, very close to a dump site uh, and a toxic waste site. So uh, we're going to see is this part of it? Uh, we'll find out. So, um, boy, and then we got a couple other court cases to go over, uh, actually where the uh, Eighth Circuit has upheld uh, uh, a Minnesotan's uh, right to uh, have free speech at, a, at an event uh, at a, in a public park and pass out literature, you know. Uh, Minneapolis was trying to prevent somebody from providing literature to the public in a public setting and um, they just got slapped down big time in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. All right, we may get into that too. All right, but first a couple of announcements. And the first announcement I have, and we'll put up the graphic here for Ray uh, Woodstrand. Now Way Ray is an employee of the, of the studio here of SCC, uh, of which uh, this show comes out of. Uh, he has nothing to do with my show, I mean, because this is all public access here. Uh, this, I mean, he's, an, he's not an employee and I'm not an employee. He's an employee of SEC, he's not an employee of my show or I'm not an employee of anybody here. This is just my own time doing this. So, but Ray, who was beat up on the east side, uh, St. Paul, had some severe brain injuries, is uh, there's a fundraiser for Ray coming Saturday, October 5th. 
and it's at the Goodrich Golf Dorm uh, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. It's a fundraiser and a silent auction. Uh, so there's a phone number here I want you to find. I probably can't see it too well there, but 651-249-1981. If you want to donate some items for the silent auction uh, or the raffles that they're having down there uh, to help raise money for raise uh, medical expenses, uh, call that number, 651-249-1981. Uh, contact Candy Peterson and ask to, hey, I want to have some donations or I want to help out uh, with the fundraiser, let me know. Uh, but it's a fundraiser and silent. It's called Putts for Ray. And uh, it's a $20 donation for Ray's fund. It includes mini golf tournament prizes, or mini golf tournament prizes, raffles, food, and silent auctions. Little Caesar's going to be there. So um, I'd encourage you to come down. I will be there. I will help out in the event. I will enter that tournament. Come down, meet me, um, say hi, see if you want to, uh, you know, let's put a little challenge out there, try to beat my score. I'm pretty good at miniature golf. I'm just warning you. I do a pretty good job at it. And uh, if you can beat my score, great. But, uh, you know, I'm the family champion. And... Uh, uh, we had a little tournament, mini golf tournament with a company I'm involved with. And once again, I won. So, you know, let's, you know, let's bring it on. You know, I'm challenging everybody here to see if they can, uh, can beat me in this deal. All right. October 5th, Saturday, come. And if you got some uh, things you want to donate for the auction, please do. Okay, the next announcement is uh, Saturday, September 21st, there's the Ele first annual elephant ride. And we got a graphic for that too, Nathan. Okay, uh, September 21st, and uh, I can't even read where the park it starts at. Uh, but go to www.sd43.org. And they're going to be riding down the St. Croix uh, Valley there. And it starts in a park in Maplewood. Um, so it would be a fun event. Uh, there's a lunch, $30 for a rider. Uh, that includes a lunch afterwards. 20 9 a.m. Huh? 9 a.m. is when it starts. 9 a.m. What park is that out of? Uh, uh, hold on, hold on. Okay. <laughs> we'll find the park. I can't read it. Should have had it in front of me here. Uh, 9 a.m., but there's a lunch also. There'll be speakers. Uh, it's a political rally event, fundraiser for SD 43 and Senate District 43. Pulled pork, picnic. Uh, 20 bucks if you don't ride. I don't ride, uh, uh, so, but I'll, I'll be there at that picnic uh, also. So a uh, couple good events that are coming up here in Maplewood. Uh, we're going to get the Stellmacher Park. Stellmacher Park in White Bear Lake. Yeah. They'll be starting out of there for the ride to go down to the St. Croix Valley or river area for the ride. Real nice ride at this time of year. Okay. Um, there's this uh, Minnesota Supreme Court case, the Bergstrom case, which was heard back in October, I'm sorry, December 2000. An 11, actually 2012, December 11th, 2012, on a constitutional challenge for a 50 year restraining order. We are now here in um, September, so we're nine months out and have not heard from the Minnesota Supreme Court on this constitutional challenge against 50 year restraining orders in this particular case. Uh, this is a tragedy and travesty of justice that the Minnesota Supreme Court is perpetuating on this man uh, who cannot see his kids and has no allegations of abuse against him, against his kids. And um, there have been allegations against his ex-wife, uh, but those have been plea deals uh, just, you know, where the wife goes, hey, uh, just 
just say you did this and then we'll work on our marriage and get back together. They did for seven years and then she attacked him again and then charged him with abuse. And uh, of course, that's just an automatic. He spent, uh, ended up spending at one time uh, 53 days in jail without being charged in Washington County. And this has been a big brouhaha for the courts because his attorney was Joe Clark and they suspended her license as of December 7, 2012, and his case was heard on December 11, 2012, in which Joe Clark was the attorney, but her license hadn't been suspended as of December 11th. The, on December 20th, it was suspended as of <laughs> December 7th. So the Minnesota Supreme Court uh, who, what, what are they doing? What's going on? And the tra tragedy, of, travesty of justice here is this person can not appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court on this issue until they issue an order. And that's the game that's going on there. Now, what's interesting, I was at an event Tuesday night with some people getting ready to run for U U.S. rep and uh, uh, and for a governor and for Senate. Um, and I was just in a group of people and I was talking with this one lady who was an attorney considering whether to run for U.S. rep in Minnesota uh, against uh, Betty McCollum. And the conversation was such that um, uh, I was talking, well, Andy Gilday showed up who is the husband of Chief Justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court, Lori Gilday. Uh, and, and I said, well, good to see you, Andy. And Andy works as a, in the Republican Party down at the uh, Capitol. And I said, well, I hadn't seen you since the Jill Clark disciplinary case uh, at the Minnesota Supreme Court. He was there watching the case, which his wife had to recuse herself because Joe Clark ran against her uh, uh, for the Minnesota Supreme Court seat. And, uh, and he goes, well, I, I, I just hope Jill gets her life together. And I said, well, don't, don't you think the Minnesota Supreme Court needs to get their act together? And he's kind of curious at that. And, 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 and I said, well, Let's see, if so, somebody raises a jurisdictional question, doesn't that have to be answered first? And if somebody raises recusal motions, don't those have to be answered first? And the attorney, not knowing the case next to me, and any attorney will tell you this without any facts of the case, will say, oh, that's, kind of, that's fundamental. <laughs> and that's what this attorney said, well, that's kind of fundamental. And I says, I know it is, but for some reason, the Minnesota Supreme Court is just ignoring those issues that were raised, and they can't do it. Of course, the Minnesota Supreme Court finally talked about recusal, and all their answer was, we did it properly, based on the rules. And, and there was, that was it. I mean, it was a little bit longer than that, but that was the gist of the statement. Uh, everybody did what they were required to do, but nobody gave a response to Jill Clark's asking for recusal. Uh, so um, there was other conversation there, but uh, the, the whole point was uh, Minnesota Supreme Court is silent for nine months. Now they have no time limit here, okay? But they shouldn't be. This is a fundamental issue of justice in Minnesota. It needs to be answered. What game are they playing? What's going on behind the scenes? With people, we should be demanding an answer from them as to what's taking place in this case. And this man is being beat up in court. He's had his constitutional rights violated and the courts are fighting back because they know there's going to be a big payout that Washington County is going to have to pay out for what they did to him. And uh, he has done nothing. Uh, to his ex-wife. He has not beat his ex-wife at all uh, and has never had his day in court uh, to defend himself except for the, you know, the plea deal that happened years before. And now Minnesota passed an ex post facto law that holds him 
uh, that says you can have a 50-year restraining order if you had two or more domestic abuse violations against you. And um, it's a new law. Those laws weren't in effect at the time he made those plea deals. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. And I advise everybody, if you're accused of domestic assault, you have to defeat that. Of course, unless you did it. You know, but if you didn't do it, pleading doesn't work anymore. Okay, you got to go and defend yourself hard because it'll really mess up your life uh, for the rest of the time. And uh, so, you know, just the birds are chirping in the Minnesota Supreme Court. What's going on there with Bergstrom? Uh, okay, um, just just a quick update here on Matamidi. You know, there's been a whole bunch of Matamidi High School. There's been a whole bunch of newspaper articles about uh, the grade school being built next to a dump site, a toxic former toxic waste site. Uh, it's a site that was on the Superfund. Uh, Matamidi had, you know, 24 acres already that they could have built on on safe land far away from the dump site that they could have built the school grade school on. They chose not to. Uh, my personal opinion, there's a financial arrangement going on there. Um, but five days after this great school was open, five working days, uh, last Monday, the Wildwood Great School was evacuated for smells and uh, fumes. And the question is, why would they, first of all, they have a positive ventilation system there. That system should have taken care of it. Okay, but... <coughs> Uh, it didn't take care of it. Um, now, the school, and I, I'm not sure I'm going to get this right, but the school basically said, hey, the, the, where, where did these fumes come from? Well, they, they said it came from, I may have this in reverse order here, okay? So one place said it was from a horse farm. It's just south and, and uh, a little east of the uh, school. Uh, another place, with the other place would have been the fire department, but I don't know which one that said it came from someplace south. Well, here, here's the problem here. Uh, horse farm smells, if you have a good horse farm, and I've been on horse farms in Grant and around that area. I've been on horse farms of 20. Yeah, you don't have this smell that had 40 horses, you know, or thereabouts. And you go through Grant, you just don't have this smell. But supposedly this horse farm with 20 horses had this horse manure smell that was the toxic fumes. But there's another reality. Just south of the school, not far, uh, there's an, uh, even closer to the school, there's a natural gas substation uh, there. Uh, hmm. It could have been those orders that they smelled. Uh, there's also uh, a lift station there that has 11 tanks for a lift station, which most lift stations only require uh, one tank. So there's a problem there with the sewer system uh, in Matamidi. Um, so is that where the fumes came from? But we got two different opinions from the school and from uh, the fire station as to what's going on here. Um, also, you know, what's interesting in this, this is a lot of complaints. Aaron Brockovich said this is a problem, uh, being so close to this uh, former Superfund site, if it's still not. I, um, uh, but the issue is they did borings on that site, and in that plan that they presented to the Pollution Control Agency, they did not present the three borings that were closest to the school and they were the most toxic. We, they got the reports, the people in Grant got the reports, and these are the three most toxic borings out of the whole thing, but they weren't included in the report. Um, so it's, there's, there's a lot of fishy business going on uh, over there with the school and with this toxic waste site and the money that's going between the old dump site and the owners of it, and uh, bad, bad news all the way around. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, update on some abortion issues. Uh, a North Dakota judge ruled you can't abort a child if it has Down syndrome. That's a huge, huge victory for life. Uh, a child with Down syndrome, 
of course, the only reason you can abort a child is for the health of the mother. That's the only reason, but you can make up any reason. Well, one of the reasons they made up with, well, the child has Down syndrome. Well, Down syndrome isn't, has nothing to do with the health of the, the uh, mother. So um, the North Dakota judge ruled, can't do it if you got Down syndrome. So this is a, a real victory uh, in North Dakota. Now, Colorado's got a little bit of a problem uh, taking place right now is that Colorado's just passed a natural rights law. And the purpose of passing the natural rights law is it, it, it gives flowers the right to life. Now, I, I guess that could be a good thing if it extends to the point then that uh, humans have the right to life, <laughs> but, it, but it doesn't. You know, uh, you know that's, that's not what they're doing there. They, but that's how crazy it is. Now, do flowers have the right to life if it's flooding in Colorado? Is it flooding in Colorado? Yeah, it is. Do they have the right to life? So do you have to stop the flooding so that flowers could live and spend billions of dollars so that there are no floods or runoff when there's excessive rains? Ah, uh, interesting stuff. It's a weird world we live in. Uh, oh, another thing, okay. Um, with this Judge Perkins in um, Scott County and Carolyn Rice, that made the Washington Times newspaper. And actually, I haven't read the whole decision, but according to the papers, I've read the dissent in the decision, um, but according to the papers, um, the courts deprived Carolyn Rice of her civil rights and access to due process and made some pretty harsh statements about Judge Person Judge Perkins and conspiring to deny it was a conspiracy with the Child Protection Services and um, guardian items and various other agencies uh, to, die, to deny her of her rights uh, to due process. So that's a that's a huge, huge issue, and uh, let me put it this way, just some other, uh, other facts in that Carolyn Rice case. Um, Family Innovations, which is a counseling service, s charged the county $107,008. $107,008. For counseling, Northland Counseling charged fifteen hundred seventy-five dollars uh, for marriage and life skills counselings, and the foster parents charged six thousand um, dollars for various fees and services to the county. Uh, understand this very critical issue here is that the Rices had private insurance that covered this stuff. So what's going on here? And this is, this could be part of this decision process that there was a conspiracy in order to make all this money to drum up these charges. But she was found guilty of de deprivation of parental rights, which does happen. It's a criminal statute, 609.26. Uh, it's something that happened to me. But if you're charged with a crime, you can have an affirmative defense. That affirmative defense means uh, you can't charge me for this crime because I had reasons to protect people. And the affirmative defense in deprivation of parental rights is you're in fear of harm of the children. And you're in fear of, uh, there's, there's basically three, about three reasons. But one of those is your fear for the safety of the children, so you take them out of that violent situation to protect them. And in this case, in Car what Carolyn Rice is being charged with is her daughter, who was claiming her father was abusing her, uh, took off to Canada uh, on her own, but they know people up there, and there was contact. Uh, and anyway, Carolyn Rice ended up there to see her daughter up in Canada, and she was then arrested in Canada but the daughter did not want to go back to the father. Uh, and this is a, an older daughter, somewhere, you know, the 15-year range. Uh, I got to get the details more secure. 
but Carolyn Rice tried to provide this affirmative defense and the judge wouldn't let her provide the affirmative defense. And I don't know all the other factors in there. I got to look into this more. But um, this affirmative defense was actually used by a man who was, uh, had his kids abused by the government, um, where the government, the kids were being put in foster care. He had two of his own children die. Third one was being put uh, in the county, held the, the other child, you know, no, no accusations of abuse against these kids at all. Uh, there was trumped up charges that there was holes in the kitchen floor that the kids can fall through. Uh, there was none, didn't matter. Um, the kids went, one of their children uh, who wasn't at issue when the two kids that died uh, <clears throat> in the foster care uh, one of the children they were having problems with and they asked the state for help and the state went and took all three kids and I know this man and he's a decent man and um, he had another child by a previous marriage after all these things the, ch the child that they're having problems with was sexually abused they had it on film uh, with the state uh, the other two kids they had in their custody were taken from them, put in foster care. Those kids died in the house fire. They weren't receiving their medical treatment. Um, a child in a wheelchair was able to be dressed at night and taken out, but they couldn't get into, they couldn't go and take two kids that are able to, you know, they just pick up and take them out. Um, just very, very fishy. But this man also had another child from a previous marriage, and that um, child was taken by the county from her mom. So he went and grabbed his daughter because he knows the abuse that goes on in the system. His other three children had seen that abuse. So he went and under Minnesota 609.26 did a, an action of kidnapping his own child from the state and uh, provided an affirmative defense. and. Uh, in that situation, and the judge just wouldn't hear it. Uh, judge Pendleton up in uh, in the uh, St. Cloud, no, um, huh, I forget the area, Sher Sherburn County area, and I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. He set bail at 2,000 and said, uh, okay, um, no same or similar, and, and part of the thing this father had to sign is that he would not take his children, uh, his daughter, from the government. And he wouldn't sign that. So the judge set a bail out of 100000 which he couldn't make. Uh, but he has an affirmative defense. Anybody can take anybody if they're seeing somebody being abused. But this judge wouldn't have it. And so that's what the affirmative defense is. And but if you can't get your information in, or if your affirmative defense is get against the county, against the government, then the county and the government's going to get uh, upset at you and uh, fight back and do whatever games they can play. Okay. Um, boy, I got another announcement. Uh, the Maplewood Communist Center is having its 20th anniversary, uh, otherwise known as the Community Center. This is on October 8th. Now, the reason I call it the Communist Center is because you're paying for it and you can't go there. Uh, it runs a deficit, um, and I believe it's run a deficit. It's all 20 years, and it's a big expense, and it's really, it's not a community center. It's a communist center for the fact that you have to pay for it and it's providing goods and services to other people who can't afford it and it, this, the Maplewood is forcing you to associate with people that you don't want to associate or don't have the money to associate but they're taking that money anyway. In other words, Maplewood is acting like a church and they have all these programs and, and well and good, okay, that they have, they have programs but it shouldn't be you, the taxpayer, paying for it through the community center because there's no constitutional authority to do that. And they should be making money. Schools is a different issue. That's in our constitution. But Maplewood needs to get their act together 
and and make this thing profitable where the people that use it pay for it and it covers the expenses or they sell it and uh, sell it to you know to the highest buyer uh, that wants to buy it and and make it run and can make a profit but because the government owns it it's not making a profit and you see all the private businesses in there now um, subway and uh, now the the massage lady sister Rosalind um, and the massage lady has a shop in there so you got all these private businesses yet you have to pay for it as a Maplewood citizen and this goes on in other cities too that you have to pay for these deficits of other people getting service and you don't get service and it's just wrong it's morally wrong it's outrageous that this is happening uh, but that's going on in Maplewood uh, right now uh, so Nathan you can get those uh, DVDs ready we're gonna play a couple clips here uh, uh, fairly soon about the tax levy that came up in Maplewood but this tax levy is the same for all cities um, but before we get into that just a couple issues on the elections uh, Nora Slawick is running for mayor and I was able to read her divorce decree and I remember of course she's good at taking your money and give it to giving it to the Vikings and and uh, again another forced association you have to pay money for to uh, organizations and people that you don't may not want to associate with or be involved with but your money's going towards that that's her mindset that's a communist mindset it's a bad mindset uh, it's destructive and and it kind of tells you the nature of that kind of individual they're not good people um, so now you can't spend your money where you want it because you got to spend it someplace else and um, so anyway uh, got a copy of her divorce decree and I, I really thought it was interesting that when she left the legislature she cited that she needed to make more money um, but she got a big settlement in 2011 of uh, about $950,000 from her divorce. Um, but there was something else going on in the legislature at that time too, and that was Michael Broadcore's accusations of people um, sleeping around with each other and they didn't get fired. I don't know if the situation, but there was a lot of people that retired at that time. And you saw a couple senators retire and you know usually happens at the end of the years but you don't make up a lame excuse and an excuse that's not even true I need to make more money she's making a lot of money uh, off of interest payments off the uh, off the divorce settlements for the 950,000 uh, made a chunk of 300 uh, about 300,000 at the beginning of the divorce and also um, got a good chunk for child support around 2800 a month plus the 4000 plus in interest payments off the 950000 that was owed her plus her salary she was making a good income and a good living and and um, it just leaving didn't make sense <laughs> it just it that was not that could not have been the reason that she left because she needed to make more money doesn't doesn't make sense to me but it, you know it could be you know but to say that she needed to make money no she had a lot okay and then um, you, you have Kathy uh, the finger Juniman who's disrespectful to her citizens she's re, re running again uh, and actually one of the candidates got a um, a, a letter. Um, Margaret Barron's got a letter from somebody out of uh, Arizona that it, it said, but it was all post stamped St. Paul and um, somebody Barrett and just retook that picture of Kathy Juneman giving the finger and said, see, you know, this is fake, this isn't real. 
you know, however, we all know it was real. It's, it's on video. There's too many witnesses that saw it take place. Uh, the still picture is just a picture off the actual video that happened. Um, but that's the nature of Kathy. And here, here's, the th here's the real thing. Um, that when these people were running, well, when Nora Slawick and Mary uh, Abrams was running for the Democrat endorsement on this, they talked about Kathy Juneman and they wanted to be trained uh, to be a good city council person like she is. And she's not a good city council person, <laughs> in my mind, uh, the way she treats people. And so, just some of the little little stuff going on in, in Maplewood. So somebody's sending out some hate mail uh, uh, to Margaret Barron's. Uh, pretty bad stuff. Um, another thing happened in the uh, in Maplewood in the uh, city council meeting that Mayor Rossbach said that the, the legislature really didn't do them any favors this year. Uh, this last legislative ses session, and but uh, there's a couple things here. First, he's criticizing his own cousin Peter Fisher, who's the state rep for part of Maplewood. Um, I think that was interesting. But d did Mayor Rossbach forget that now Maplewood has to pay no sales taxes? They don't have to pay any anymore. That's a big money saver, somewhere around $100,000. Uh, that the Minnesota legislature also gave them around $3 million for the, the fire training center, the regional fire training center built in Maplewood. Now, that's not a favor. Um, let's see, they gave uh, Maplewood approved a motion for a TIF for 3M, and the legislature approved that. Uh, so the 3M builds in Maplewood. That, that's a big deal. And then now Maplewood is receiving local government aid. That's a big deal. And so that's a, that's a whole lot of money coming into Maplewood and saving Maplewood that the legislature gave. And they did what Maplewood asked them to do with 3M. So, uh, we're going to show this video here, and it's Chuck All talking at the Maplewood City Council about a proposed tax levy. And, and you're going to hear some of this stuff as to why um, Chuck All proposed the 0% levy increase because we got more money coming in, so we don't need a levy increase, and, but we can still have a levy increase. Of three up to three million dollars, if around three million dollars, if we wanted to, but let's hear ex his explanation. Okay, if I can have the overhead, uh, the PowerPoint uh, presentation. Hopefully, that technically is ready to go. There it is on the screen. So, uh, Council tonight, uh, what Gail and I are presenting to you is that your request um, is to have some time to talk about uh, where the levy is. Uh, Obviously, my recommendation to you was a 0.0% levy, um, and I want to explain a little bit about that and, and why that's at where it is. But tonight you have some options to uh, either move dollars around in the levy or um, have a higher than a 0% levy. Uh, but uh, we should talk about that a little bit and, and make sure you, you understand exactly uh, where we are. So. Um, as mentioned, uh, my recommendation was at 0.0%. Um, so you know, you, you probably saw different versions. And at one point in time, actually, Gail and I had a, um, a, an email to you that was going to say, uh, the state imposed on us parameters such that that 0.0% wasn't really that brilliant it was literally the maximum amount we could levy anyway. And so, in effect, the legislature said that you could have a 3% levy less the amount of local government aid and uh, the amount of the um, sales tax. And you have to you know, declare that information. So, in effect, we could not, under the legislature's intent, 
increase our levy. However, after Gail did a bunch of homework and a number of the people at the league started talking to the Department of Revenue, um, because levy limits were added to the bill at about the 11th and a half hour, as a matter of fact, there was no debate in committee, no discussion anywhere through the process, but on the last day of the session, uh, once they decided on the final LGA, the legislature added the language into the bill. Well, unfortunately, the language that they use, or fortunately, I should say, the language that they use, um, I won't go into the long explanation, but in effect, it double counts. So instead of Maplewood only being able to increase the levy, I think Gail one time told me we only could increase the levy by $4,000. I believe you could increase the levy by $3 million simply because of the two differences in the interpretation of the levy limits. So my comment here was the legislature intended to have levy limits that put these parameters on us. But because of what we have, uh, you know, we literally have uh, an extensive amount of room. But I hope you understand there was an intent by the legislature to say we should have stayed at 0.0%. .0 and so thus the recommendation from the staff so yeah so th this, this is the interesting part here is that uh, this what I thought fascinating is here we got this pattern going we're going to push something quickly through the end of the session on these levies and the DFL party messed up there, there wasn't, they didn't debate it, there was no time for debate, they didn't want to debate, they just wanted to push this through, and so the levy issues messed up. So the intent, when there was discussion, was to levy, uh, to, to get rid of um, the sales tax for the cities and municipalities and government agencies, they would no longer have to pay sales taxes, and that way they would save money and wouldn't have to tax you. Uh, and then the state would be getting less money. Um, and then local government aid would be extended to all the cities. Uh, well, I can't, I don't know if it's all of them, but now Maplewood gets local government aid, which they didn't before. And so that since there'd be this increase, the idea was, hey, the, the complaint was, well, uh, the state, you, you give the city a certain amount of money, but the cities keep raising the revenue, so give us more so we don't have to. Well, Maplewood, because this change at the very end was rushed through, Maplewood now, by the written law, can charge up to an additional $3 million. In other words, there's, they put in a limit as what you can have as a levy, but because of the way the law was written, now Maplewood can do three million instead of the intent was that Maplewood would only be able to do about four thousand. So uh, again, this is the what problem you have when you have one party in full control of all branches of government, and the the when you don't have a side a negative input uh, into an, a position, things aren't. Um, vetted enough and vetted correctly and all the sides aren't heard and that's what we have in Minnesota that's why our legislation with the, the Viking Stadium everything there wasn't this counteraction to say here's the consequences of what you're doing and so you know Chuck all says we recommend zero uh, and so because of that uh, and rightly so uh, Council Member Bob Cardinal puts a motion to have a zero raise, although they can do up to two percent. They recommended as he recommended a zero, so let's hear what he had to say and see the result of that. The staff recommendation: City Council adopt the attached resolution setting the maximum city tax levy for 2014 at zero. Zero per zero, and that would be eighteen million four hundred thirty-nine thousand hundred thirty dollars. And setting the date for the public hearing on the twenty fourteen levy and budget for Monday, December 9th, twenty thirteen, at seven p.m. As part of the regular city council meeting, this levy combined with the proposed 
EDA levy of 89,270 will result in a total levy of 18,528,400, which is zero, which is no increase over 2013 and, and it is a zero increase over 2013, 0%. There's a motion. Motion dies for lack of a second. Um, motion dies for lack of a second. Did you hear the birds chirping? You notice how Mayor Rosbach just kind of held it out there a little bit? Just the birds chirping. Well, why didn't Rebecca Cave second that? That would have been a good campaign position because you, you would have had a discussion and you could have voted down the motion after the vote, but you would have had a discussion and you would have put Kathleen Juneman in a tight spot. Uh, and now you, Kathleen Juneman's let free uh, because the big issue here is people, it isn't, they don't vote to raise the taxes until after the election and this group will go for the full two percent a raise and they don't need it they're making more money this year and property values are going up and so that's the other reason they don't need to increase the levy because the property values have gone up so with increased property values you get more taxes for that uh, with uh, the LGA local government aid fund you get money for that with um, not having to pay sales tax anymore you get more money for that so um, boy they're just in this they're spending gonna spend money like crazy in Maplewood that's why you need a new city council that's why you need Diana Longry in there Margaret Barons and Rebecca Cave better do the right thing and vote against any tax levy increase um, I can see where somebody can say we, let's put the two percent in there as an option, you know, and and you know, so we have room to work with things if we need to work with things. That's the maximum they'll be able to raise it, um, but uh, and then vote it down if they go for it. I can see that happening, but she shouldn't have done it. Should have had a discussion right then and there. All of them should have. Kathleen Judiman should have had a discussion. Just because you second a motion doesn't mean you have to vote for it. And I hear them complain about that. Uh, you know, well, why'd you second it if you're going to vote against it? You know, well, big deal. You have a right to vote your conscience and, and uh, what you believe. Maybe you wanted to just hear the discussion. You knew you had the votes in your favor. So uh, it's a bad deal. Now, if Maplewood wants some more money, they ought to consider developing letting private industry develop some areas that are developable. So <laughs> Aldi's wanted to go in just south of uh, Premier Bank on White Bear Avenue by the Mall of Maplewood, and uh, the city council wouldn't let that happen. Well, there's a loss of tax revenue. Another developer was before them again wanting to put homes in an area that already has water and sewer to it, and Maplewood goes, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, we'll let you build there. We're losing out on $250,000 a year in tax revenue. And they had no reason. There was no understandable, justifiable reason to do that, except they didn't want to do it. There was a moratorium at one time put on developing that the city council did uh, when the uh, real estate was in a crash. Um, that's understandable. That's gone. Now's the time to get loose of that. Uh, people are building, people are buying, and house prices are going up. If somebody wants to develop, let them develop. You know, their money's at risk. Now we're, the city is not getting money, and of course they can't pay for their own Maplewood Community Center. Uh, they're taking money from you there. Uh, another interesting thing happened at the Maplewood meeting is that the Hill Mary uh, asked for a uh, be able to put in tennis courts. Um, 
and what I when I was hearing that, I just thought it was fascinating that part of the deal is if you build a structure, you have to hit plant trees for a tree preservation project. Now this tree preservation project for Hill Mary, they have to put in 30, about 30 trees. Uh, that's what the city is requiring. But where they are building this tennis courts, um, there, there's no trees there that, that I can see, or very, very few. But because they take this land and put tennis courts on it, now they have to go and uh, plant 30 trees. Now Maplewood, in the Savannah, they just went out and tore down tons and tons and tons of trees and ha have nothing to do to replant any. It's amazing the hypocrisy that the Maplewood City Council has. What trees did they replant for the ones they tore down in the Savannah? You know, I, I don't believe they have. It's just uh, very, very uh, hypocritical of them to do that. Um, all right. Let's see, let's go on to uh, other issues here. Uh, of course, just in Maplewood, remember the, the 20th anniversary of the Maplewood Communist Center, October 8th, should have some people down there protesting the Communist Center. And uh, you know, that, that place should be owned by a private uh, entity, and then they'd be paying property taxes, and then the city wouldn't be wasting all their time and energy and hiring staff to deal with that place. Uh, it's just bizarre. And all these other athletic facilities and, and concert venues and things like that, they're out there, they're making money, and they're having to compete against a taxpayer-funded thing, and there's plenty of space. We don't need the Maplewood Community Center on our tax rolls. Okay, uh, another Eighth Circuit decision. There was a man that would go down to the Gay Pride event and he'd witness to people. He'd pass out literature. Now, I've actually filmed people down at the Great Gay Pride event passing out literature and people engage in comments. Now, the, you know, in a discussion, this li literature would be of religious nature. I was filming for their protection and also evidence to show that people really liked the conversation and were engaged in it. Uh, however, uh, the Minneapolis Parks and Recreation Departments put a restriction on this person from passing out literature during the Gay Pride Festival. Uh, and this Mr. Johnson sued that was denying his freedom of religion and freedom of press and freedom of speech. Now, uh, there was a festival, there was a parade, and it was in public area, and he was not using a bullhorn, but he was in the park, public area, and just passing out to people who wanted to receive it. Well, they told him he couldn't do it, and so he sued, and it's been all the way up to Minnesota uh, Parks, uh, Minnesota Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, and um, he won that case in the Eighth Circuit. I'm sure this will go all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, but they came down pretty heavily handed and said, you can't, you can't do this, Minneapolis. <laughs> People have the right to pass out literature. Uh, there's no state interest in stopping him from passing out his literature because it's protected by the Constitution of the United States. So uh, they got slapped down pretty hard. But again, here's the mindset of people who don't want people to exercise their liberty. And it's coming from the city of Minneapolis. And that's the way they behave. And that's the way Mayor Rybeck uh, behaves. Um, you have to actually pass a law that's constitutional. <laughs> so uh, very interesting decision there. Uh, OK. Um, Well, folks, that's about it for today's show. We're, we're running out of time here. Oh, a couple comments, uh, brief comments on Syria. <clears throat> um, 
no matter how much we don't like Assad, like we didn't like Saddam Hussein, Assad allows many groups in his country to live and practice, and he let Christians worship and practice their faith in Syria. Okay, But you have the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda in Syria who was fighting Assad, and Assad was defending his country from these people that were fighting him. And this is uh, the wars that go on all the time over there in the Middle East. Okay, so we're at war with Al-Qaeda, but what Obama wanted to do was fund Al-Qaeda, who we're at war with, and go against Assad, who was allowing a lot of freedom for a lot of people. And this whole thing about chemical warfare, this is the first time we ever fought a country over chemical warfare. And Nancy Pelosi and Obama getting up there and decrying the deaths of children by chemical weapons, but they support chemical weapons for abortions where hundreds of thousands get killed. It's the hypocrisy to the core, and that's why our nation's in trouble, because we don't have a core. We don't have a foundation in, in our country anymore, and we're seeing that judgment come on us. And if this war happens, it will be the beginning of a big war. It won't be a small one. It will be a big one. All right. If you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week.